will uh, move around a little bit as much as I'm allowed to on this stage, but normally I'd wander around all through you, but uh, they want me up here for the camera. So, um, my name's Evan Patterson. I'm a special agent with the FBI. Um, I've, I've been doing this now, this is my third year, I think, giving uh, talks here, and I, I appreciate uh, you guys always asking me back. Um, obviously, I haven't offended you enough, so I'm back for more. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about um, kind of identity theft. So, you know, the theme today is what, what can you afford to lose? Obviously, um, the idea is you can't really afford to lose anything, but we're going to talk about identity theft from the perspective of how easy it really is. Um, so, again, just like in years past, my goal is to scare all of you and make sure that you delete all of your Facebook accounts. And before we get started, I always have to do this. How many people have a Facebook account? All right. How many people have Twitter? Okay. My hand was up for both of those. I do have both of those accounts. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you're more than welcome to. I rarely post anything. If you want to uh, friend me on Facebook, I will not accept your friend request. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's that's like my little you know private thing. I, I don't really post that much on Facebook either, but uh, we'll talk about why that is here in a minute. But um, I kind of try to keep that separate and into my personal space. So does, does anybody willing to admit they still have a MySpace account? A couple of you are. Okay, good deal. Outstanding. Um, if for those of you that had a MySpace account a while ago and you never actually went in and deleted it, it's still there. So all that information, all those crazy backgrounds and, you know, the ponies and stuff that you put as your background and stuff, all that information about you is still out there, so make sure you take care of that. But let's talk about identity, uh, identity theft. So uh, we're going to show you exactly how uh, simple it really is. Um, it is kind of frightening how simple just little pieces of data can, can really uh, be used to steal your identity. What, what kind of information do we need to protect? Um, so what are the consequences? Obviously, um, Identity theft is a bad thing, but we'll talk about a couple of things that can happen, and then how do you protect yourself? So, if you're talking about verifying, how do you verify who somebody is? So, uh, one of the things that I do in my job is I, I make phone calls to organizations and say, hey, based on some information that we as the FBI have obtained, it appears uh, a server or a website of yours has been compromised. Well, generally what I get is, how do I know you are who you say you are? How do I know you're not some guy sitting in India telling me that you're the FBI, but you're really not? Well, I have to have a way to verify. And one of the, one of the problems with that is, you don't know because I'm calling you on the phone, right? So let's say you call into the cable company and you want to change your cable package, right? What happens when, when you call the cable company? They look at your caller ID, so they see what number you're calling from. Then they ask you to put in some sort of identifying information, your telephone number, for instance. And then you get on the phone, and, and maybe the last four digits of your social security number. And then you get on the phone, and of course, what do they do then? Then they ask you for those things again. I'm not sure why those systems can't transfer that information, but that's really not the point of this presentation. So, um, but so, so you know, a little piece of information, your last four digits, well, you know, we give that out relatively regularly, right? All of these people who work at the cable company theoretically have access to the last four digits of your social security number. <laughs> hmm, that's probably not a great idea, especially because it is used other places to verify who you are, right? We'll talk more about that. So where is this information found? So so you're you're trying to verify your auth that you you are who you say you are, and this information is out there, so I can verify who you are, but then somebody could use your information to verify that they are who you are, if that makes any sense at all. Um, and so then let's talk about how do we protect ourselves from verification. So let's talk about what is that type of information that's out there right now, okay? Or, or, or what type of information you need to be protecting. Your social security number. Obviously, if I have your social security number, it's pretty much game over, right? I can pretty much do anything I want to and, and you know, prove that I am you. Now, obviously, if I have your social security card, that's much worse because I can walk into a bank and say, here's my social security card. I can walk into the DMV and say, oh, yeah, I can verify who I am. Here's my social security card. But just the number itself, because we are a technological society, so much is done online these days. If I have your social security number, I can do a lot of damage to you as an individual just, just with that. We talked a little bit about the last four, and we're going to go over later why this stuff is important and the things that you can do with it. The first three, the social security number. Why is that important? 
where you were born, right? So the first three digits of your social security number are, are based by region. So most people who were born in West Virginia have a 232 or 233 social security number. So just knowing the first three digits of your social security number, I can tell something about you. Kind of interesting. What kind of dates are important? Date of birth. Obviously, if I have your social security and your date of birth, I can pretty much verify who you are, and I can tell anybody I am that person. What about your kids' dates of birth? Why would that be important? Because all of you use crazy good passwords, right? Like X4Q13892 exclamation point dollar sign. No, because you use things that you can remember, like your kids' dates of birth. And you, you, you'll, you'll be tricky, right? You'll put, oh, I don't know, uh, your kid's name and then their date of birth. Oh, I'll never guess that, right? <laughs> All right. Anniversary. Now, this really doesn't apply to any of the men in here because none of you know when your anniversary is. So obviously, <laughs> you wouldn't use it as a password because you never remember your password. But for the women in here, you remember your anniversary, right? Okay? Something to consider. Graduation. Why is that important? What, when you graduated? Well, one thing I can tell probably generally how old you are. Might be more further information for, from me. If I can tell where you graduated from, I can send you a phishing email saying it's from the Alumni Association because Alumni Associations never ask for money, right? Yeah, exactly. And a date of purchase. Hey, I went on Facebook. Look at our cool new house. We just bought it yesterday. We're so excited. Why is the date important on that? We'll talk about that. Not yet. Relationships. Who are you married to? Who are you living with? Who are you? Who are your kids? Who's who's who are the members of your household? Why is that important? Well, obviously because I want to um, you know throw off the census in 2020, right? No, that's that's not the important part. <laughs> who you're living with will tell me more information about you. Who you're married to? Obviously, once again. We use kids' names. We use spouses' names for passwords. Those are the types of things that why that's a problem. What about your parents? Why is it important who your parents are? Specifically, your mother. Mother's maiden name, right? Another verifier. Let's talk. We'll, we'll talk more about that later. Different places where you currently live. Obviously, if I know where you currently live, even if it, just a city, we we talked about this in years past. There's websites out there with your name and your city. I can pull up your current address and any other addresses you have in that city for free. This is not because I'm an FBI agent. This is because it's out there on the internet. Okay? If you're trying to hide from somebody, which you know you probably aren't trying to hide from people like I am because of what I do, but if you're if you you know it's just not really a great idea for everybody to know where you live. Um, I don't have a home phone number. Mostly that is because you know I'm too cheap to pay for a cell phone and a home phone, right? But what is what what do you have to do? With a home phone number, if you want it unlisted, you got to pay for it. Which, frankly, I think is a total scam, but that's not important. Um, so, but cell phones aren't listed there. But what happens when you go to a, a store and you swipe your credit card? What do they say? Tell me your phone number. You think they could just, you know, keep that in some database and never let it out? No, they sell it. And and that's more not from a security perspective. That's just so people, you know. Advertisers are calling my cell phone, which just bugs the snot out of me. Your previous addresses, we'll talk about why that's important. Your hometown, where were you born? We talked about the first three digits of your social security number. I can get you a, a general region. Obviously, you know, if you're born in West Virginia, that doesn't narrow it down as much, but you know, larger cities and, and, and uh, larger, more populous areas, I guess I should say, have smaller regions where those numbers come out of. So that can be important as well. Your work location, your school location, where are you at, at various times, obviously for your kids. Think about this, and we've talked about this before in, in previous years. If you take pictures and you're uploading them onto the internet, and you have your GPS enabled on your, on your phone or, or whatever device, so it takes GPS coordinates from those pictures. If you take a picture of your kid at school, take a picture of them at the bus stop, and you take a picture of them you know, somewhere in the backyard, how often, what percentage of time are they at one of those three places? 80%? 90%? So with 90% accuracy, I can probably tell you where your kid is. And you're posting that out there publicly on the internet. And everyone on the internet is a good-natured individual, right, who would never want to harm your child. 
your contact information. We talked about the telephone number, old telephone numbers and new telephone numbers, your email address. Email address, frankly for me, most of, mostly it has to do with I don't like getting emails from you know things that I don't care about, spam messages, all that kind of stuff. But we'll talk about uh, something that's a little more security related with that. And then obviously a PO box. And frankly, I just threw that in there because I don't like to have two bullet points. <laughs> All right, so, so other miscellaneous things. Credit card numbers. Obviously, if I have your credit card number, I get that, that code on the back. I can pretty much buy anything I want online, right? If I have your credit card number. A lot, most, most legitimate organizations online require that little code. And of course, you can memorize your credit card number, but you never remember that stupid little three-digit thing, right? You always got to go find your wallet wherever it is in the house. Um, but the last four digits, why are the last four digits important? Well, number one, they're really easy to get, right? On every receipt that has your that you swipe your credit card, they don't put the whole credit card number anymore. They used to, but they always put the last four digits, right? So when you go and pump gas and you forget to grab that receipt, what does the receipt have on it? it has your name and the last four digits of your credit card number. We'll talk about why that's important here in a little bit. Pets. Why are pets important? Well, number one, I always tell people you can find my address. Okay. You want to come get me? I've got plenty of guns. I've got two dogs, and everybody in the house knows how to use the guns except the dogs. So that's a safety thing for me, okay? But why else is it important? Because once again, you people use your pets' names for passwords, right? Because And again, you get all crazy with it, and you throw in like an exclamation point, but it's really not that difficult for me to guess it. Schools attended, same thing. You're, you know, you're, you're a proud, as I am, you're a proud Aggie, you're, you know, Texas A&M. So there's, there's all sorts of phrases and stuff that I know then to try for your passwords. Type of electronic device. Why is that important? Okay, we'll talk about that. So what can you use social security number for? Well, obviously social security number is the holy grail. If I have your social security number, you're done. Now, what happens if, if you have your identity stolen? you got to contact the Social Security office. You, they issue you a new Social Security number, theoretically, and you have to update it with all the random places. In the federal government, we're actually moved, finally, finally moving away from Social Security numbers as an identifier. Uh, moving away, you notice I, I use that phrase, we're moving. That means currently we're still using Social Security numbers. Not a good idea. Um, but basically, any financial transaction or government thing, you're, that's how the government identifies you, right? Your Social Security number. We issued it to you, and that's what we're going to use to, to, so you can prove who you are. One of the things that, and we actually have a guy in our office that, uh, um, you know, a lot of times doctor's offices will require Social Security numbers. Most insurances do not require Social Security numbers anymore. So one of the guys in our office was going to uh, have a medical procedure done, and he walks into the office, and you know, they say, okay, fill out the form, and so he hands it back and said, oh, you left your Social Security number blank. And he said, yes, I don't give out my Social Security number. They said, oh, well, we require Social Security numbers to provide service. And he said, okay, um, well, how do you protect my Social Security number? So we only have paper files, and they're all locked up uh, at the end of every night. And he says, so all those files that are stacked up on top of that locked cabinet that is completely full, you guys find a place for those every night when the cleaning crew comes in, right? Well, I mean, maybe they're not all locked, but the office is locked up, and, it, and so he walked out the door. Because they can refuse to provide you service, right? They, they're allowed to do that. But he wasn't willing to risk his identity being stolen because of that. So one of the things that you need to do when you go to your medical practice, if you've already given it to them, okay, eh, we're a little late there. But if you go to a new practice and they say we require social security numbers, say why? The insurance com my insurance company does not require social security number, and most of them don't these days. Something to think about. Medical transactions, we talked about that. All right, last four digits used for varying identity, identity for services. We talked about the cable company, right? You call in. What's the last four digits of the account holder's social security number? And all of, every time you call in, and, and I don't know why, uh, if, if anybody is here from uh, our, our sudden link representative, I lose internet connection all the time, and I have no idea why. So I always call them. I mean, literally, there was a point this summer where I was calling them three times a week. Hey, lost it again. And every time I called, I, didn't, I never talked to the same person. 
So every time I call, I'm giving them my name and the last four digits of my social security number. Something to think about. And why do they why do they collect that in the first place? Does anybody know? Why does a cable company collect your social security number in the first place? Credit check, exactly. We talked about in the last one slide, financial transactions. There you go, social security number. Now, what? how do you get around that? They have to do a credit check, right? No, they don't. They can provide, you can provide a deposit or some sort of upfront payment to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm good for it, right? And if I don't pay my bill, here's 100 bucks up front so that you guys can cut off my service and then cover my bill out of that $100 or whatever, whatever they require. Okay? Now, I told you, this summer I've been giving, you know, it's one of those things that when you first get in, you don't really think about all this stuff. And so I set up my sudden link account before I really thought through some of this stuff. That's why I'm here talking to you. So you all can think through this stuff now. Learn from my mistakes, right? First two digits can tell where you are. Here's the chart that tells you exactly where you were born based on your social security number. Now, obviously, this isn't exactly where you were born. But now, did I get this from social security or did I, you know, social security for a long time refused to admit that this was true. No, 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 it's some secret formula. No, it's not. This is publicly available on the internet. I pulled this off two days ago. Okay, and, and it's not on Social Security's website, it's on, you know, Joe's website, or you know, somebody who's actually sat down and take, taking the time to figure this out. There was uh, some researchers that were doing some research that they were saying within, um, you know, if they had, I think, five or seven digits, or five digits, the first five wow. digits that they could predict the last four with 60% accuracy. That's kind of concerning. And there is actually some... Um, algorithm that they use to generate those numbers. They don't just actually go sequentially, but obviously if you can guess the algorithm, then I can guess what the next number is going to be. Date of birth, used in the medical transactions. So my wife recently had a baby. We're in the hospital. Every time a nurse came in, what do they do? What's your name and your date of birth? Every time. And where? how do they verify that? Your wristband, right? It's printed right there on your wristband. Every, literally, I mean, I don't know how many nurses were in and out of that, that room over the four days we were there. Every time they come in, before they give you any kind of medication, before they check your blood pressure, every time, what's your name and date of birth? Account information. Uh, financial transactions, we talked about that. Used online to verify your age. Right? Every time you go to a website, like Facebook, for instance, requires you to put in a date of birth. I actually had an interesting uh, experience the other day. So, um, I was setting up a website in my uh, personal life, and I was going to set up a separate email account just to be associated with this website. So I went to, um, I think it was Outlook.com. No, it must have been Gmail. Went to Gmail, and I, I just wasn't thinking, you know, I just put in some random date of birth, and I just selected a year. And I obviously didn't go back far enough, and it said, hey, I'm sorry, you're under the age of 13. You can't, uh, you know, sign up for an email account based on, and there's federal law that has to do with that. So I, you know, do what any 13-year-old would do, right? And I went in and changed my date of birth. And Gmail said, I'm sorry, you're not 13. And you can't have an account. So, you know, and I'm sure they've done, done it with a cookie or something like that. But they, I literally had to go to Outlook and create an account because I could not clear whatever it is in my browser that they were holding on to. I could not clear that out of it. Kind of interesting. Now, what normally happens when you do that? You go in there, you change the, oh, oh, yeah, it was a mistake on your part, I'm sure. You're really not 12, right? Yeah, because none of your kids have ever done that. By the way, putting in a false, I always have to say this, don't give Facebook your real date of birth, but putting in a false date of birth for Facebook does violate Facebook's terms of service, and technically they can cut off your account. They can close your account. Because they have huge teams of people that all they do is verify that everyone there is exactly how old they say they are, right? But they'll let you change your date of birth. They will let you change your date of birth a certain number of times, something to consider. <laughs> um, and then obviously it's used for your semi-friends to remember when your birthday is. So, you know, you always see the, the people who are joking around and say, you know, hey, happy birthday on Facebook. Oh, today's not really my birthday. And it's really awkward when it's your twin that's wishing you happy birthday, right? They've forgotten when their own birthday is. Your anniversary. We talked about using it for passwords. Obviously, uh, most of you, uh, based on a quick demographic search, it doesn't appear that this applies to most of you, so you don't remember. 
Um, but uh, you know, security questions. That's that's one of the things that you can use. You know, when when you forget your password right, because we all use these crazy passwords like you know, the name of our kid one two three four, and we can't remember that. And then you have to answer your security questions. When did you get married? When did you grow, what school did you go to? Where did you graduate from college? Whatever. Phishing attempts. Um, you know, you've you you bought something from um, the mall over here, the engraving place in the mall over here, right? And you know, because you hadn't heard this talk yet, you gave them your email address, and now they send you spam every year on the same day, saying, "Hey, your anniversary is coming up. You know, come shop in our store, and you know, get your spouse something special." So if I know when your anniversary is, I send you something saying, "Hey, I know your anniversary is coming up. Uh, click on this link, and you know, buy something special for your missus." And I send you to my website instead of you know the things remembered or whatever. <laughs> Um, and then secondary identif identity verification, again, talking about so social security number, um, date of birth, those things, um, it's, it's, it's just another way that I can verify who you are, whether I'm a good person, whether I'm a bad person. When did you graduate? Passwords. Security questions. Fishing your classmates. How many of you have seen those ads? Classmates.com, right? Hey, see who you know, so and so from your high school is is on classmates and is looking for you, right? I don't want to talk to any of those bozos anyway. <laughs> that, that has never enticed me. Why would I want to talk? If if I wanted to talk to them, I would be talking to them, and they wouldn't need to find me through classmates.com. Right? Plus, there's always Facebook, and everyone's on Facebook now. Um, it again can be used to determine your age. Use can be used to determine your education level. As as someone who's uh, you know in the I shouldn't say I'm in the practice of fishing people, but as someone who would be in the practice of fishing people, the more information that I can know about you, the more successful that fishing attempt is going to be, right? So if, if I know you have a bachelor's degree, but you don't have a master's, I can start sending you stuff about, hey, why don't you apply for our master's program? Okay? If I know you only graduated high school, but you don't have a bachelor's degree, hey, come check out our online college. And I'm sure none of you have gotten anything like that. I still don't know how I get on some of these lists, right? Um, and then, obviously, the college you attended. If, if I know what college you attended, um, I, I know one more piece of information about you. So why are purchases important? Dates that you purchased your house. Does anybody know what this is? I know some of you in the back probably can't see that. This is a screenshot from Monday where I went to the FTC's website and said, I'd like to get my free annual credit report. Why did I tell you I went to the FTC's website? Because freecreditreport.com is not free. Right? If, they, if there are ads on it for TV that are actually catchy and not you know, just someone holding a sign up there like the government ads normally are, probably not going to be free. Okay? So I go to the FTC's website, make sure I go to the real free credit report, and this, it, I picked whichever credit union it was, and it says, what year was your most recent mortgage established? And it gives me choices. Now, first thing to remember is there's not an infinite number of choices here, right? They do have none of the above, but if I guess enough times, I'm probably going to get that right eventually. But you've already told me when that was because you put on your Facebook account, hey, we just closed on our house. We're so excited. It's our first house, blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm going to guess that you probably have a mortgage. And now I know when that is. Phone numbers you've used, ever used previously. So why does it matter? No one can call me at that number anymore. Well, people who are looking for my credit report might need that information. Um, and then obviously what county you live in. One of the other things that they'll ask is, which one of these vehicles did you have a loan on at one point in your life? So you're posting pictures of that sweet new ride that you got on Facebook. I now know you, again, probably had a loan on that car. It can also be used to verify your identity. How does that work? Well, um, Amazon, for instance, will uh, verify who you are based on your recent purchases. So if you call into Amazon and say, hey, you know, I'm locked out of my account or whatever it is, they say, well, what did you just purchase? You're trying to verify who you are. Now, this can work backfire when you say, well, I didn't just purchase anything. And they say, well, there's you know, $3,000 going to Russia. Um, obviously not a good thing. 
But you know, to possibly show your address, hey, you know, you take that picture of your brand new house, and you got your address listed there in the front. One of the things that um, I really don't post a whole lot of pictures. I post pictures some, but one of the things that is required, my wife has to run any picture that she posts on Facebook through me, because I think about things differently. She's like, oh yeah, look, you know, what our kid is, and and we actually don't post pictures of our kids on Facebook, but. Oh, look, look what our kid is doing, and you have your kid in the front yard, but you also have the front of your house with your address there. Something to think about. And then obviously, uh, um, what type of vehicle you drive. Hey, I know, you know, if I guess that information from your previous, from that previous slide I just showed you, tell what kind of vehicle you drive. The goal here is not, hey, no one can ever know anything about me. If you see me out in public, and I'm in my personal car, you're going to know what kind of car I drive, right? It's kind of hard for me. Like, I say in my car. Sitting there, in the driver's seat. What, you steal it? No. Don't call the cops. I gotta go. Um, you know, so it, that's not the point. The point is to make it. And this is what I always tell people. My goal with physical security and cybersecurity is the same thing. Given enough time and enough resources, somebody can get in to your house, can get into your online accounts, can get into business uh, web servers, whatever it is. My goal with, with all of my security is not to make it impossible. My goal with my physical security is not to make my house Fort Knox. My goal is to make it difficult enough that you go rob my neighbor. Right? So if, if I'm a person after financial gain online and I'm trying to hack into your account, if you make it difficult enough, how am I going to mess with you? Because I don't have time for that. I can go get 16 other people in the same amount of time that I'd spend in getting to your accounts. We'll talk about a couple of key things that you can do. Relationships, phishing attempts. Hey, I'm your classmate from, you know, 2005, um, you know, Texas A&M. Remember we took that one marketing class together? I don't remember who was in my marketing class. And you go, oh, yeah, I remember, I remember you. Well, or can you send me a picture or whatever? Phishing attempts, not a good idea. Use security questions. Maiden name, we talked about your mother's maiden name. If you used to contact you on social media sites, hey, that long lost classmate. Um, something else to consider on social media sites. So what happens um, when a, a national incident occurs? Hey, um, you know, uh, a tragedy, you know, uh, uh, you know, like the Navy Yard shooting, for instance. What happens in the media? What do they start doing? Start trying to figure out who, you know, once they get a name, especially who, who this person is. Who are his parents? Who are you know? Who had relationships with him? So my Facebook account profile is completely private. The only people that can see things are my friends. So what happens to the news media? Uh, if it's it's private. Uh, we probably shouldn't dig further, right? No. Well, you know, well, let's see who his friends are. They go talk to your friends and say, well, you you know, it's the same thing that we do in law enforcement. Hey, I know this guy's a drug dealer, but his Facebook account profile's closed. Let's go talk to his friends list and see if they can pull up his Facebook account. Right? So just because you've set your account to private doesn't mean that information can't be hacked. We're not talking even about hacking into Facebook. We're just talking about social engineering, going to your contacts, the people that you've let see that information, and asking them to, to, to show them. Relationships. I can go and talk to those people. Who is this person? What, what is he like? You know, what, is, what does he drive? Where does he live? All those kinds of things. Well, this made a name, and then your passwords. You're, you're talking about your kids, your pets, etc. Where you live. I already talked about that from a physical security perspective. I don't want people, bad, especially bad people who I investigate, knowing where I live. I don't want them to show up there. Um, you know, this is my work life. This is my personal life. You want to come after me at work? That's fine. Come after my family. We're gonna have problems. I can create a history everywhere you've lived, everything that you, you know, every place that you've moved. So one of the things that I always found was amusing when I got into the FBI. The FBI does, you know, pretty extensive background check, right? Well, I was pretty young when I got in, and so one of the things they wanted was every place that I had lived and every person that I lived with longer than six months uh, to back to when I was 18. Of course, that was when I was in college. I lived in a different place every year and then every summer. So I had to go back and figure out, I don't even remember half of those addresses, right? <laughs> well, guess what the FBI now has? They have a pretty accurate description of exactly where I was and what I was doing for that time period. Now I had to provide that as, as you know, to get my top secret clearance, and I obviously willingly did that. You don't have to provide that to random people on the internet, and I would suggest that you don't. Um, 
where were you born? That's a, a security question. Where you went to grade school? That's one of the ones that my bank uses that I, I absolutely refuse to answer. One of the things that finally is starting to kind of take hold in the security world is, hey, let's not force them to answer specific questions. Let's say, what question do you want us to ask you that no one else would know, and then you can put in your answer. That's a good idea. If you see websites and companies using that type of security, those are the types of places you want to patronize because they're actually thinking through this stuff. Where you went to college, we've already talked about, and then your kid's location. If I can tell with 80 to 90 percent of the time, 24 hours a day, where your kid is, we've got a pretty good chance of snatching them when you're not looking. Verify your identity with your telephone number. Harassment, obviously, uh, one of the things that uh, I investigated a case two years ago where anonymous hacked a well, a bunch of databases, but specifically in West Virginia, the West Virginia Chiefs of Police. Well, what they had was contact information, including, in some cases, cell phone numbers and home phone numbers and home addresses for all of the chiefs of police in the state of West Virginia. They posted that publicly on the Internet, and, of course, all these you know, punk teenagers that have too much time on their hands start calling them, you know, oh, you know I'm outside your house, I've got a gun, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, you do that to a, a normal person, That's probably, especially in West Virginia, that's probably not a great idea, but it's a really bad idea to do it to law enforcement, because you know they have a gun. But, you know, it, it's harassing phone calls. Not, not a huge issue if it's just a phone call, but what if it escalates, okay? Spoofing, you can, uh, um, so one of the things that happens when I call my bank is they say, oh, we see you're calling from a telephone number that's on your account already, right? Good. This is on my account. But what if I'm a bad guy and I spoof that caller ID? Because I know what your telephone number is. Oh, we see you're calling from a phone that's on your account. What if the, someone steals your phone and you've got your you know, bank contact information in there, your banking app, whatever it is, they contact your bank. Oh, we see you're calling from your a phone that's on your account. Something to think about. And then geolocation. Um, you know, because all this information is out there with, with cell phones and, and even landlines, I can tell with pretty good action, especially with a cell phone number, if you have legal authority, exactly where you are. With the landlord, I can give you a pretty good idea of, okay, you're probably in this three-mile area. Social media sites, email. One of the things that uh, there are a num number of sites out there that do this. So email, yeah, you don't want to get spam. That's annoying, blah, blah, blah. Phishing attempts, okay, that's bad. One of the things that you can do, there are a number of sites out there that will do this for you for free, is you put in an email address, and it will show you all the social media sites, the major ones, that have an account with that email address. So if I'm trying to get a bunch of information about you, and you're putting it out there, I just have a list of all the sites that I need to visit. Oh, he doesn't have a Twitter account, he doesn't have a Facebook account, he's got Moco Space. I know you always like Moco Space. Um, you know, those are those, so those are the sites that I need to go, and all I have is your email address. And now you've given me everything else, right? Because you don't set your privacy settings correctly. You can search forums with the same way. Phishing emails, obviously, we've talked a lot about that. And then I can hack your email account. So I have your email address, and you know your email address is bob at hotmail.com. So I go to hotmail.com, and I say, hey, I forgot my password. Can you send my uh, you know, password to my backup email. Gmail, one of the things Gmail does is they block out the first part of the email, or most of the first part of your handle, at whatever, outlook.com, hotmail.com. Well, if you use the same email, the first part, so if you have bob at hotmail.com, bob at gmail.com, bob at outlook.com, I've got a pretty good idea of what your email address is going to be. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have multiple email accounts? And I don't mean like personal and work, I mean multiple personal accounts. All right, just making sure I'm not like, you know, talking about something that doesn't apply to you. Um, so it says, hey, send this, um, this, you know, my password recovery email to the secondary email account. Well, Google blocks it out. Some, some sites do, some sites don't. But if you use the same one across multiple websites, I know where that is. One of the things that happened recently is Hotmail started retiring old addresses. Because people had to log into them for you know 15 years, and you know they decided we we want to reissue these email addresses. Well, I see that your account has expired at hotmail.com, so I go in and set up a new Hotmail address that it uses your exact name, and it sends the password recovery email to that account that I now control. 
I reset your password, not only do I have full access to your Gmail account, but you can't get in. Not a good idea. Spoofing email to others. If I know what your email address is, I can spoof an email that, that looks like it's coming from you, from your spouse, from whoever, and you're more likely to accept that. One of the things that we've seen with like uh, Facebook scams, specifically the Nigerian scams, hey, you know, uh, I'm a, um, you know, a prince, a, you know, a Nigerian prince, and I've got ten million dollars, blah blah blah. It means a lot more when it comes from one of your friends' accounts. Hey, I just got ten million dollars from this guy in Nigeria. I know most of them are scams, but this guy actually, I mean, I, I literally, I will show you my bank account where I got ten million dollars from this guy. You should sign up too. Well, if some dude on the street tells me that, I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever. But if James, my boss, comes to me and says, hey, no, seriously, I just got $10 million, I'm going to be like, all right, let's go, let's sign up, right? So if I know more information about you and I hack you know, one of your friend's accounts, it means a lot more. If I spoof an email, oh, yeah, I know this is from you know my coworker or whatever, I'm a lot more likely to click on it than if it's from some, you know. And if you ever see a, an email address that's at something.ru, not argue it's Russia. Don't ever open it, okay? Just delete it. Little tip. Credit card, we can make purchases online. You can create a fake card. One of the things that's um, actually you can literally go into like a Target or a Walmart with a, I mean, if you look at it, it's a blank white piece of plastic. You've got the same magnetic code. You can buy the stuff online to do it for less than $100. You get a credit card number. You get a couple of pieces of information, and you actually create a physical credit card that you can use. So I get your credit card number and I now I, I don't have the last, you know, the, the three digit code on the back, but I've created a physical card. So I can't shop on Amazon, but I can go to Walmart and get whatever I want. And then, you know, online banking, shopping, hey, what's your credit card number? You know, Amazon, if you log into a, an Amazon account and you're shipping it somewhere that's not the home address that they have on file for you, they will make you re-input re -input your credit card number. It's the way they're verifying that it is you that's making that purchase. Both in the same way. Last four digits of your credit card number. It's extremely easy to, to obtain. We talked about that. It's on a lot of receipts and, and um, things like that. And then uh, it can be used for ver phone verification and to change your Apple ID information. So last year, I gave you guys a real-world example of a writer from Wired that got hacked. Completely everything he had, MacBook Pro got wiped, iPad, iPhone got wiped rem remotely through his Apple ID. And basically the way that this works is, um, slide on this or not? No. Um, you have, you call Amazon and say, hey, I need to add a credit card number to my account. I say, okay. Um, you know what's what's your um, you, uh, your username or the email address associated with your Amazon account, your billing address, um, and then I'll say there's one more piece of information, but it's publicly available. And they say you say okay, you provide that information, you say, and you create a fake. There's websites that will do create fake credit card numbers that will pass most industry checks. So you can't actually charge something to it, but it will pass the basic al algorithmic check to say, yes, this is a valid credit card number. You give them that credit card number, you hang up. Thank you very much. That's all I needed. Appreciate it. You go into Amazon and you say, hey, I lost my password. And they say, okay, give us your name, your billing address, and the last four digits of a credit card associated with your account. You've already done that, right? You just created, you put a credit card on your Amazon account. You get, um, is that how this works? I'm trying to think this through as I go, oh, that doesn't make sense. No, I think you can get it through. Anyway, you get the last four digits of the credit card number. You call Apple, okay? And Apple requires what? Name, billing address, last four digits, credit card number, and they will reset your password over the phone and send it to your uh, an email account. So now, I have reset your Apple ID. I get into your Apple ID. I know where you are because you've turned on Find My iPhone, right? I can wipe your device remotely because, you know, if somebody were to steal it, you would want to know where that is. 
And, and then, you know, I have all the information basically that's associated with your Apple account I now control. Not a good idea. This is why you should never put your pets' names on there. Because you'll have to rename your pets. Right? Change your passwords. Don't use things that people can guess. We'll talk more about that in a minute. I just think this is hilarious. Someone figured out my password, now I have to rename my pet. Schools, security questions, where your kids are, what neighborhood you live in, university mascot passwords, and then phishing attempts to the Alumni Association. Type of device. This is one of my favorite things that a celebrity has ever done. Oprah is asked to promote products, right? So she promoted the Microsoft Surface, a new tablet. They're going against iPad. They want to make sure that people know about it. Oprah has a lot of marketing, marketability. A lot of people will buy whatever she says to buy. So she gets on her Twitter account and says, got to love the Microsoft Surface. It's awesome. I bought a bunch for a bunch of people. It's so great. I use it all the time. Except that Twitter tells where you posted from. So she's talking about the Microsoft Surface, posting from her iPad, clearly not using the Microsoft Surface. Oops. Why is, why is her being on an iPad versus a Microsoft Surface important? Because if I know what type of device you're using, if I know you're using an Android phone, I'm going to go after it very differently than if you're using an iPhone because they have different security vulnerabilities because they're written by different companies. If I know you have a Mac as a home computer versus a Windows PC, I'm going to go after your accounts differently. Okay? So if you're posting these things online about what you have and, and Facebook and Twitter tells where it came from, people know what kind of device you're using. There's known vulnerabilities for just about every piece of software that's out there. So you go to this very cool website and you can pull up every vendor that's ever created a piece of software, you can put in what product you're looking for, the, I, the Apple iPhone, and it will give you a list, and this is like you know a quarter of one page, and this thing goes on for pages and pages and pages, of all the vulnerabilities that are out there for the iPhone. And, and a lot of these have been patched, assuming you actually updated your iPhone. How many of you have iPhones? How many of you are not running iOS 7 on your iPhone? The new fancy one that nobody likes that you can't see, you know, it all looks different. So you do not have the latest security updates because you're not running iOS 7. So there are known vulnerabilities out for iOS 6 or 5 if you have like an iPhone 2 or something that I can use to target your phone. And I don't even have to find the vulnerabilities. They're all listed for me. And this is on Symantec's website. That was nice of them, right? They're doing this for security purposes. So they can say, hey, if you're a manager of some sort of system, you need to know that if these vulnerabilities are out there, they're either are patched or aren't. And if they are patched, you need to apply the patch. And if they're not, you need to be aware of it so that if somebody's trying to attack it, you can defend yourself. So where is all this info? We talked about a lot of different stuff, social security numbers, credit cards, all this stuff. This is a Facebook profile. You go to the About page, right? Well, there's the anniversary day. There's mom's maiden name, because he listed the family member. There's your kids' names. There's your current city. There's your email address. I went to one place and got all of this information. 30 seconds. Should not be this easy. I don't know this guy. This guy actually lives in Australia. I don't know this guy from Adam. Never met him before. Have no idea who he is. But I now have all this information about him. Don't make it easy. If, if I want to find out who you are and where you are, I can do it. I work for the FBI. That's what we do, right? Don't make it easy, even for me. Make me at least use some of my classified databases. Don't make me just go to the Internet and find you, right? <laughs> So what's the risk? So we talked about identity theft. Here's all the pieces of information you need to protect and why. What's the risk? Total identity theft. This lady had an illegal immigrant steal her, her um, social security number and used it to open bank accounts and credit cards, receive food stamps and free medical care for her, the birth of her two children, she got a mortgage, she got a driver's license, she got a job. 
all of those things with a social security number. And then you know what happened? The lady said, the, the victim in this case said, hey, somebody has stolen my social security number. Contact social security administration, says, hey, I, I'd like to get a new social security number. My identity's been stolen. Well, they sent a letter to the subject. Hey, somebody's claiming that your, you know, your, your social security number has been stolen. So the subject said, no, 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 she stole my social security number. I'm the real person. And of course the government, because we always do everything right, issued a new social security number to the subject and declined to issue one to the victim. The victim actually spent basically 12 years trying to get, and eventually she was prosecuted, 12 years trying to get this fixed, including filing taxes under the taxpayer identification number, which is used for immigrants, not for <laughs> citizens, because we all use our social security numbers. So that's the issue, total identity theft, where not only do they, okay, yeah, you know, used to, they would use it to get a job, right? Okay, now the Homeland Security has decided, let's let's push out uh, a product called, or a, service called E-Verify, they electronically verify, yes, this name matches with the social security number um, and provides a little bit of information about you know who, who you're basically hiring or who you're checking on. And so they've decided, well, if I just become this person, if I completely steal somebody's identity, then I don't have to worry. I can, I can basically, she was 12 years, this lady was dealing with this. There you go. So, what do we do about this? This is not going to be rocket science, guys. This is not going to be groundbreaking, oh, there's this new technique that's going to protect you. This is the stuff you've already heard, you should already be doing. Okay? Change your privacy settings. At the very least, go through your privacy settings and say, do I want this public or not? If you want it public, more power to you. I have no problem with that. It makes my job easier. Oh, I didn't say that. Um, that's fine. If you want, you know, there are, for instance, I, we have a number of political candidates that need a Facebook profile because that's where the people they're trying to reach are. They have a lot of information about where they are at various times and things like that. You have to have that information public, period. I get that. Make sure that you know what is public, number one, and number two, that you've said, yes, I want this information to be public. It's not complicated. Use passphrases. Why do I say passphrases? I didn't say passwords. What is a passphrase? My dog likes cookies is a much better password than 4Q6 exclamation point caret tilde parentheses. Why? Well, number one, you're actually going to be able to remember it. You're not going to write it down, right? Because we're not supposed to write our passwords down. I'm sure none of you do that. And if you do, you certainly don't hide it under your keyboard. And if you don't hide it under your keyboard, you, you get really tricky and you hide it under your mouse pad because we'll never look there. <laughs> None of you write them down. Yes, nod with me. Okay, just, just pretend. So you use passphrases so you can remember them, number one. Number two, the longer a password or passphrase is, the harder it is to brute force. It takes longer to sit there and guess every combination of 12 letters than it does eight letters. And... Similarly, 20 letters versus 12 letters, right? So the longer it is, the harder it is for me to get into, and the easier it is, theoretically, if you use a passphrase, for you to remember. Something to think about. Use different passphrases for different accounts. I understand that you all have, just like I do, just in my government life, I have probably 15 different accounts that all have to be, you know, between 12 and 20 characters with 16 exclamation points and, you know, four letters and eight numbers and, and it has to be changed every 90 days and you can't write it down and blah, 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 right? There's a lot of rules about what you have and you can't do. It is really important to use different passphrases for different accounts. If I have your email account, don't let me get into your Facebook account and your Amazon account, and your Apple ID, and your et cetera, et cetera. Use different ones. Use tiers. Hey, I'm never going to visit this website again. I have to create an account. I'm going to use a throwaway passphrase. Hey, this is my email account. This is my main email account. I really don't want anybody to get in there. This passphrase is only used for email. And I have a completely separate one for Facebook. 
Now, I'm going to tell you something, and you have to listen very carefully. In your home life, this does not apply to work, in your home life, it is safer for you to write down passwords than it is to use the same password at various sites. Why is that? It's a lot less likely that somebody is going to break into your house and steal your password list than it is for somebody to get one password and use them elsewhere. Why is that not true for work? Well, number one, you don't control the space at work. And I know you would never steal your coworker's password and send an email to the boss, right? Don't write your passwords down at work. At home, if you feel like it's necessary, it's better than using the same password everywhere. Do not do that at work. Did I make that sufficiently clear? We're all going to go back and write our passwords down at work now, aren't we? That's not what I said. Use an antivirus. How many of you have an antivirus on your home computer? Okay. When was the last time you actually checked to make sure that it was updating the virus definitions? Recently, within the last six months. That was a lot less hands than the first time. If you are not paying for antivirus or you are not using a free product that is updated continuously, you are not protected. If you have virus uh, a virus database from two years ago, there are probably you know, 4 million new viruses that you are now susceptible to. How many of you are using something before Windows XP? Windows ME, Windows 2000, Windows 98? A couple of you, Windows 98. Those, and, and in, uh, I think it's is it April 2014, XP is no longer going to be supported by Microsoft. If you're on Windows XP, you need to upgrade by April. Why is that important? Microsoft releases, releases patches and says, hey, we found a security vulnerability. You need to patch it. As of April 2014, they're no longer going to do that for Windows XP. Don't go to Vista. Vista stinks. Go to 7 or 8 if you like that. They're supposed to issue a patch. That's up to you guys. Use anti-spyware. Well, I have antivirus. Use anti-spyware. I don't care. Use both. You don't have to pay for both. There are free versions that are out there. But if you're browsing a website and you're not looking for antivirus and something pops up and says, hey, here's an antivirus product for you, don't click on it. <laughs> when you go out looking for it, and, and PC Magazine, and I mean, there's tons of websites out there and, and organizations that rate various things. If you don't understand this stuff, read about it. There's, Google is your friend, right? You can find someone has asked, if you have a question, it doesn't matter how stupid or how dumb it is, Someone else has had that same question, has posted that question to the internet, and then someone has made fun of them and answered it on the internet. Okay? And Google will find it for you. It's really, you don't have to post it on your Facebook and say, hey, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, and all your friends make fun of you. Google it, and somebody will have already made fun of somebody else. Don't click on links and emails, especially if they're unsolicited emails, even if they're from a coworker. Don't click on things in emails. At least call and verify, hey, did you send me this Word document? Yes. All right. I'll open it. Don't release information over the phone. Again, especially unsolicited. If it sounds too good to be true, not it probably is, it is. Don't think you're going to get, you know, marry a Nigerian princess and get $10 million. It's not going to happen. And don't be stupid. That's my parting remark. Any questions, comments, concerns, side remarks? Anything? Last shot. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs>